podcast. All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Greenlight Bookstore Virtual Reopening Party and All-Star Review. I'm Jessica stockton Banulo. I'm the co-owner and events and marketing director at Greenlight. I'm gonna hand things over to this evening's MC, Saeed Jones, in a few minutes, and then we'll hear from tonight's amazing lineup of authors. First, just a couple housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see and hear you. They can see that you're here though, and you can see a count of fellow attendees at the top of your Zoom screen. The location depends on what kind of device you're using, but hopefully you can find that. We don't have a Q&A tonight, but you are welcome to post your thoughts and comments in the chat. It's great for the speakers and fellow attendees to see the enthusiasm there, so we encourage that. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our social media channels later on. Thanks to all of you who purchased admission to tonight's event, that means a lot to us, and to the many of you who added on a book or two to your ticket purchase. If you're inspired to buy any of the author's books tonight, we'll be putting a link to view and purchase them in the chat. So, this is a party. And I don't know about you, but I feel like we really need a serious party right now, properly social distance party. Since Greenlight closed and locked our storefronts on September, sorry, September, it feels like September, Saturday, March 21st, which was about 1 million years ago, uh, this has been a struggle. Um, as probably every small business has experienced since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been difficult decisions, hard losses, moments of panic, lots of trial and error. But luckily, along with my incredibly smart and resourceful business partner, Rebecca Fitting, we have a fantastic staff, many of whom are watching now. Hi, guys. Um, and they've helped us to repeatedly reinvent our entire business model to keep finding ways to offer books and connections and conversations and customer service to our communities. We've figured out how to dramatically expand our online order processing capacity. We've moved our entire events program online. We've applied for countless grants and loans. We've workshop safe procedures for curbside order pickup and even taught ourselves how to hand sell books via social media. And amid all this reinvention comes an opportunity to listen to the voices of our staff and to the voices that we're hearing outside the store to re-examine our processes in terms of power and bias to somehow try to become better when we're at our lowest. And through it all, our community has been incredibly supportive, whether it's giving us thumbs up through the windows, all of us wearing our masks, or reminding each other on Twitter of the importance of shopping local, or buying literally truckloads of anti-racism titles through our websites. And the authors you're gonna hear tonight are part of a vital part of that community. Some of them reached out to ask what they could do to support the store, and many more answered the call when we contacted them with this crazy idea for a kind of fundraiser party. Because this is a party but it's a really wildly different party than the many that we've hosted at Greenlight over the last 10 or 11 years. It's obviously not a gathering of a lot of people in our store space, and it's also not a definitive moment where everything is now back to normal. But it's a step on the way that's worth celebrating because we're finally almost ready to welcome you back into our stores again. We are planning for a soft reopening of our spaces for actual browsing sometime next week. And this is the part where I ask for your patience as we stretch our small business bandwidth to continue to reinvent everything about how the bookstore works and prioritize safety for our staff and our customers. We're not going to go back to having events in the store and many things are going to look different than they did before, but we are still your bookstore and we can't wait to see you. And the real test of what green light can be is still before us in the months ahead as we deal with a constantly evolving new normal. It's been heartening to see the communities of mutual support which have arisen in these times of crisis and we're all going to need to continue to support each other as local businesses, as neighbors, as fellow humans. We want to continue the process of deeply examining and reinventing ourselves to become a better community partner and we hope that our community will continue to value shopping local, especially when it comes to the books that are going to see us all through this because that's why you're here. It's because of the books. Each author that you'll hear from tonight is in some way a friend of Greenlight. They're our neighbors. They've appeared on our stage for launches. They've advocated for indie bookstores and public forums. But more importantly, they are also, every single one of them, incredibly brilliant creators whose work has changed us and expanded the world for us in very real ways. We're in awe of their talents. Honestly, we're a little starstruck to even be hanging out with them. And we are so glad you're here to enjoy the art they have to offer us. If you somehow don't have their books yet, click on the link we'll be pasting in the chat and buy them. For less than 20 bucks, for less than a pound of ink and glue, you can have your reality shifted a little bit too. 
and support the creators who are doing that work for us. So the first of our authors tonight is also our MC. So I can talking, stop talking, stop talking, and you can hear someone else's voice for a change. Sai Jones first appeared at Greenlight in July 2014 as part of our quarterly poetry salon created by our fabulous alumni bookseller, Angel Nafis, to present his collection, Prelude to Bruise, which went on to win awards from Penn, Lambda Literary, and the Publishing Triangle, and was a finalist for the National Book Award. Fast forward to 2019 when he presented his wonderful Kirkus Prize winning memoir, How We Fight for Our Lives, in front of a sold out crowd at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. That book is out in paperback next week and it is a wonder. I can't recommend it highly enough. Said grew up in Texas and is a former New Yorker and now lives in Columbus, Ohio, which he makes sound like a paradise. Said is a beloved friend and supporter of Greenlight and just a lovely human being. And now you are lucky to have him not only to MC tonight, but to share some of his own poetry as well. Dear, dear party guests, please welcome the ferocity himself, Said Jones. Hello, my ah. virtual queens. Ah. Hello, yeah, all right, there's my dog, one second. Okay, <laughs> hi, Caesar is here. I appreciate all of your tweets and chats about him. Yep, see, there we go. He is just famous. Uh, I am so excited to be here. Jessica, um, you know, on behalf of readers, writers, um, and, and book lovers everywhere, just shout out to you. Thank you so much for the work you have done. Um, you're instrumental in, you know, your community in Brooklyn, but also, you know, internationally in a way here. You, you, you reach all of us, um, but also, you know, it's no small order what's been asked of, you know, independent bookstores to weather this moment. So I just, you know, the warmth, uh, joy, um, brilliance and ingenuity you've brought to, you know, every interaction, you know, an event I've had with you. I love that, you know, you're doing that now. So, you know, thank you. Um, and of course, thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. Um, I see the, the chat is on and popping. I love it. Shout out to Boise, Idaho. Shout Shout out to Singapore. Okay, we stand. All right, I love it. Um, I'm going to give a quick shout out to all of the wonderful people you'll be hearing from tonight. Then uh, Caesar and I are going to read a poem, um, and then we'll turn it over to our first reader, Gia Tolentino. So we'll be hearing from Gia Tolentino, Nathan Englander, Min Jin Lee, Jonathan Lethem, Nicole Dennis Ben, Colson Whitehead, Lev Grossman, Ann Patchett, Tanahasi Coates. Valeria Lucelli, and last but not least, Jennifer Egan. Um, and I'm just, you know, excited to be a part of this. These are events that, you know, give me another miracle to make it to as well. Um, so thank you again, Greenlight. Um, okay, so this is um, a new poem I wrote. Um, the title is A Run-On Sentence at the End of Time. Ruby rotted in my ruined mouth history begins as one blessed lyric at the very end of a bad love song. Because blind to time as I be and been unreliably remembered as any black body in a time measured in dead black bodies, I need you to believe at least one of us will be left dancing a dark circle under bird heavy tree branches at the blue hour before dawn after the last fire burns itself quiet, having burned down the last building on the last block in the last city I built for the both of us, brick by thieved burden. Way back before I taught the mockingbirds to sing all of my names for you, then shot them down one by one, before two birds got away and took all the names and songs with them before you taught me not to grieve the sudden silence that followed, because every song is someone's history, and history is how men learn to lie. Back before you gave me another man's body in the dark and watched me tell him that I loved you, before we killed time to avoid killing each other, before those two birds came back with another man's name in their mouths, before the mockingbirds multiplied in the dark as easily as men lying to each other about history, before the future looked as innocent as a white man, smiling under a white hood while waving a white flag, before we heard a blessed lyric at the end of a bad love song and briefly believed all the lies were worth it. Thank you for letting me read that new work. 
Um, so our, uh, for, I see your virtual love. I thank you. I appreciate it. I return it to you through the airwaves. Uh, our first reader of the night, I stand. I stand. Um, I refuse to sleep with men who do not own a copy of Gia Tolentino's incredible book, Trick Mirror, Reflections on Self-Delusion. Um, it is going to be published in paperback on July 14th, which is a mere three apocalypses from today. Um, and she, of course, is a wonderful staff writer at The New Yorker. Um, her piece on Robin is, you know, still one of my favorite uh, profiles. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Gia. Hi, guys. Um, thank you so much, Saeed. It's such a, it is such a pleasure uh, to be in this lineup. I miss green lights so much. <laughs> I miss walking in with my dog and she gets a treat. She's, she's also here in the back uh, <laughs> saying hi to Caesar. Um, the pandemic has really reminded me there's no substitute for these bookstores. There's no substitute for walking in and not knowing what you're in the mood for and suddenly getting it right in front of you. And so thank you all for being here. One upside to these virtual events is that we're hanging out with people from Idaho and Tokyo and all over the world. Um, I'm just gonna read something I wrote last week actually for an anthology that's being put together by the artists Christopher Ho and Daisy Nam called Best Letters from Asian Americans. <laughs> um, dear friend, it's June of 2020, warm and green in the natural world with pain and death and promise in these institutions. I'm signing all of my stupid emails, even to strangers, with the wish that they find peace in the middle of this grinding and gorgeous revolution, the hope that I'll run into them this weekend in the street. I feel right now like the world is a nesting doll of reckonings. I feel made up of them. There are more within me than I expected. The past seems to cascade and encapsulate itself. Decisions leading to the lack of them next time. Choices masquerading as inevitabilities. Who have I fought for and how have I done this fighting? Who's actually benefited? How many times have I thought I was moving in one direction when I wasn't actually doing so at all? I'm eight months pregnant, which has made me consider the fact that this child will have no idea or at least no experience of what came before this moment. It's made me think about what I want them to see. It's not lost on me that I kind of dread the idea that they might do anything considered prestigious, that they might pursue some form of upward mobility, even though that has been in many ways the organizing principle of my life. I didn't know it was originally. I thought I was just trying to get for free a bunch of things I couldn't pay for, like college or flights to new places. I thought I just wanted health insurance or a chance to stop running. I was never ever deprived, only sharpened. And I forgot to consider that it wasn't mandatory or foreordained or anything to stretch your luck and your charm to cover your minor lack. I was subconsciously, I'm realizing, considering the hypothetical child I'm now carrying. I didn't want them to be president of some club in high school and throw the annual fundraiser for a needy student that would end up being their own self. I wanted to take them to new places just for the hell of it. They would never feel responsible for keeping me out of indigence in old age. And with these desires, with this greed for present and future unencumbrance, I identified and I laughed at, but I never pulled away from the language I was learning. I arranged my expressions in the syntax of laminated name tags and annual dinners, of establishment deservingness, of getting white people to redistribute other white people's money in a slightly spicier manner, of making people feel progressive just for listening to my ideas, of being the safest possible version of an interesting choice. When I thought about other versions of me, but the people I cared about, the people I wanted to be unencumbered, I imagined I was making the path wider. You have to access some power in order to hold people accountable. But of course, and I missed this even as I learned it, you don't have to, and in fact, you shouldn't do this alone. Lately, the same ripple is coming through all of my text messages. Should we have learned, the, should we have learned this language in the hopes of being able to use it at cross purposes? Are we neglecting much greater possibilities? What does it mean to be a symbol that an institution is changing if it only ever changed enough to let you in? I'm realizing, it's always the year of realizing things, that I've devoted so much individual effort to reaching a place where I could advocate for the collective that I ended up doing much more, I think, for the cause of individual effort as anything else. But with everything, as with anything, the promise comes in remembering you're not alone, never alone, never first, never last, never singular, 
when anything is keeping you awake. The world right now is a nesting doll of reckonings. The little ones are rattling, breaking open the next ones. I do, in fact, feel unencumbered. I have had so much grass and sunshine. I can see this baby kicking me from the outside. I don't want anything for them except the desire and, yes, the freedom to fight. Love, Gia. Thank you, guys. There we go. Gia, that was gorgeous. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, also, this is a shirt to answer your question. I am keeping an eye on the chat. I love it. Um, our uh, next uh, reader tonight comes to us by way of Toronto, I believe, uh, Nathan Englander. Uh, Nathan Englander's most recent novel is Cottage.com. I just like, what a title, Stan, I love it. Uh, uh, he's also the author, of course, of Dinner at the Center of the Earth, the collection What We Talk About When We Talk About Anne Frank, and of course, the internationally best-selling story collection for the relief of unbearable urges. Uh, shout out to Nathan Englander. Oh, thank you, Saeed. Hi, friends. Um, Maybe the dog won't bark for five minutes. We're all going to talk about our dogs. I do want to say, uh, I'll start with the dogs. Well, first, uh, I just want to dream. I can see everyone's faces. Uh, it's so great to read with so many dear, dear uh, old friends who I miss. I pretty much miss everyone who's not living in this house. But nonetheless, uh, this is a dream group to read with and uh, just such a fan of everybody's work. And it's like basically like reading with my syllabus. I teach all of you. Um, so that's nice. And uh, I don't know what I love this bookstore so much like i can't even tell you uh i really love green light and uh maybe some friends will nod their heads but uh, i i as a writer i basically never have a positive feeling uh, i surely don't get out the front of a store with one but green light honestly makes me feel good as a writer i really feel appreciated as a fiction writer in there and that i can't even tell you what that means also it was my local forever and they are so loving and kind to my me and my family i'm not that they got my daughter hooked on ivy and bean we're on now like nine thousand seven hundred forty eight book in the series. Uh, that's a prop, but we love some Ivy and Bean. They're nice to the dog. They were even nice on the day where she uh, snatched a croissant out of a child's hand in the uh, uh, kid section. Uh, I replaced it, the croissant, not the hand. Anyway, that's that. What else do I want to say about it? Oh, yeah. Uh, I guess the book is called Kaddish.com. Uh, it's maybe about the intersection of grief and the internet. Uh, I, it takes me longer to explain a book than to uh, read the whole thing out loud. So if you want to know what it's about, uh, probably ask your grandmother. I bet her reading group did it. Um, that's my sweet spot. I'm just going to read you like two pages and then uh, go on to these wonderful readers. Uh, here goes. Mirrors covered in front door ajar, collar torn and sporting a shadow of beard. Larry leans against the granite top of his sister's fancy kitchen island. He says, everyone's staring at me, all of your friends. That's what people do, Dina tells him. They come, they say kind things, they feel uncomfortable, and they stare. It's only hours after the funeral, and honestly, Larry hates himself for bringing it up. He really thought nothing could add to the despair of his father's loss, but this this quiet, muttering stream of well-wishers has made it for Larry all the worse. What he's taking issue with is the look that he's getting. It's not the usual pain nod one naturally offers. Larry's convinced there's a bite to it, condemning. He doesn't know how he'll survive a week trapped in his sister's home, in his sister's community, when every time one of the visitors glances over, Larry feels himself appraised. And so he keeps raising his hand to the top of his head, checking for the yarmulke, sitting there, like a hubcap for all its emotional weight. Its absence at his own father Shiva would be the same as standing naked before them. Sneaked off into the kitchen with his sister, their first moment alone, Larry unloads his complaints in a hiss. Tell them, he says, to stop looking my way. At a condolence call, you want them not to look at the, Dina pauses, what are we? The condoled, the aggrieved, we are the grievances. The mourner, she says, you want them not to show that they care. Dina laughs, her first since they put their father into the ground. This is so like you, his sister tells him, to make it negative, to complicate what can't be any more simple. This bitterness in the face of what is pure niceness is on you. On me, are you kidding? Are you really saying that today? You know that I am, little brother. I love you, Larry, but if you choose even yes today to throw one of your fits, my fits, don't yell, Larry, people can hear. Fuck the people 
Oh, that's nice. I mean it, Larry says, thinking that fit may not be a completely inappropriate word. Go on then, curse at the terrible people who will cook for us and feed us and drive carpool for me all week and make sure that we don't mourn alone. Yes, curse at the nice men who washed our father's body and prepared the shroud and laid the shards atop his eyes and now come to make a minion in this house. Spare me, Dina. It's my morning too, and I should get to feel at home in your home as much as them. Who's saying different? But you have to understand they aren't used to it, Larry, used to what you do. Dina takes a breath, reorganizing her thoughts. Memphis Jews are even more conservative than the ones we grew up with. In Brooklyn, even the edgeless have an edge. Here, if you're going to be radical, people may a little bit stare. Thanks. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Nathan. Um, our next reader, you know, I understand this is a very competitive space, but I've got to say, I think Minjin Lee is like the best dinner party host. Like I have had the the, the pleasure, the honor, the glory of, of, you know, benefiting from. She's just incredible. But also, she's a dope writer. Um, she, of course, uh, is the author of Pachinko, uh, which was a finalist for the National Book Award for Fiction. Uh, President Obama read it um, and had this to say. He called the novel a powerful story about resilience and compassion. Uh, she is the recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the Radcliffe Institute. I'm gonna turn it over to the wonderful Min Jin Lee. <laughs> Thank you, Saeed. I'm sending you a little K-pop love. There you go. <laughs> um, so good evening. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. The last time I gave a reading at Greenlight, I was sobbing the entire time. My publicist thought I was having a nervous breakdown. So I'm gonna keep my shit together today. <laughs> um, last year, the New York Times asked me to weigh in on the question, what is power? And um, I thought that was an incredibly hard question. So growing up, um, I didn't talk very much. And the power that I always wanted was um, to know how to speak well in public. So I'm going to read you a little bit of that essay. And I'm reading it tonight because there's so much that troubles me about the world right now. And I'm afraid I'm very afraid to voice my concerns sometimes because I'm afraid of punishment, uh, rejection. I'm afraid to offend people. And yet sometimes we must. And I think writers, we feel very strongly that we must. In Western books, heroes spoke well and could handle any social situation, not just through action, but also through argument. In Korea, a girl was virtuous if she sacrificed for her family or her nation. But in the West, a girl was worthy if she had pluck and if she could speak up when she's afraid. And as a kid, I had watched Koreans criticizing a man for being all talk and no work. But in America, a man was considered stupid or weak if he couldn't stand up for himself. So both things were true. I didn't want to talk but I didn't want anyone to think that I was stupid. My freshman year in high school, I joined the debate team. I could hardly manage group conversations with my peers, but I reasoned that it was necessary to learn how to argue. And debate felt almost impossible. I was a terrible debater, but that was better than nothing. So I did it for one year before I quit. One day, I noticed a poster in the hallway for summer classes at the Hotchkiss School, which offered electives that Bronx Science didn't have. So I sent away for a catalog, because back then they had catalogs, and I found a class on public speaking. I asked my parents for the money so I could take this class, and they gave it to me, even though it must have been a lot for them. And at Hotchkiss, the teacher gave us assignments, like tell a long joke, or explain a piece of art, or persuade a listener to an unpopular position. I told a really long joke and nobody laughed. I wasn't very good, but I was starting to understand rhetoric. For the following summer, I mailed away for another brochure and this time for Phillips Exeter Academy, and I took another public speaking class. And then I went to Yale for college and 
I felt profoundly outclassed by my peers who had attended the private schools that I had visited during the summers. They spoke with elegance and ease about music and art and faraway places, and they wrote beautiful papers about books I hadn't yet read. Some knew Latin and Greek, and I stumbled through my classes and ill-advised romantic relationships. I majored in history, and without a clear plan, I went to law school at Georgetown. Not once did I consider being a litigator because that seemed like professional debate. And I thought that I'd be better suited as a corporate lawyer. And I figured I should try to be financially better off than my parents who work throughout the year without breaks in an underheated store scrimping to pay their greedy landlord who refused to kill the enormous rats that roamed in the basement. After my first year at Georgetown, I went to the career services office because I needed to learn how to do a job interview. And the career counselor, an older white woman, said to me in the gentlest way, you need to boast about how great you are. You're an Asian girl, and when you boast, you're playing against the stereotype of the meek oriental. Your interviewer will never think you're bragging, and I don't give this advice to pushy white men. She was telling me of how the world might see me. And I had to talk and I had to build myself up because others might see less than there was. And though I couldn't really do what she said, I never forgot her words. When I sold my first novel, I was no longer a lawyer and I was 38 years old. And in preparation for a very, very small book tour, my publisher hired a media trainer to coach me for two hours. And the trainer had written a book, so I read it. And I learned that each event is about the audience. And this idea helped me so much because no matter how insecure I felt, I could forget myself and focus on everyone else. I write novels and now and then I give lectures. I come from many tribes immigrant, introvert, working class, Korean, female, public school, Queens, Presbyterian. And growing up, I never knew that people like me could write books or talk in public. And to this day, I worry that if I mess up, others like me might not be asked again or allowed to come in. This is how outsiders and newcomers feel. It is neither rational nor fair, I know. I'm 51 years old, and after more than four decades of living in America, I realize that like writing, talking is painful because we expose our ideas for evaluation. However, like writing, talking is powerful because our ideas may in fact have value and require expression. As a girl, I did not know that I had this power, yet this is my power now. Thank you. Uh, Minji Lee, thank you so much. That was beautiful. Um, I love as, as people are reading um, over the course of the night, people are discussing it and sharing links. Um, so, you know, if you were listening and you were like, you want to read um, that essay, it's um, from the New York Times and, and several people shared it. So thank you. That was powerful. Um, Jonathan Leatham joins us next. Uh, he is the best-selling author of 11 novels, including The Feral Detective, The Fortress of Solitude, and of course, Motherless Brooklyn, winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award. I'll turn it over to Jonathan. Unmute. Oh, there we go. I know this drill. Hi, guys. Thank you, Saeed, um, and everyone. It's great to see you. What an amazing uh, constellation of people to be looking at on a on a Zoom. I'm so I'm so psyched, and um, I'm you know I'm a fan. Uh, uh, Gia, you you have no way of knowing this, but um, you were the last author event I went to before the shutdown. I, I went and saw 
you and Reese Kwan talk on stage at Scripps College here in um, California. And um, I was gonna bum rush the stage and, and introduce myself, but you were way too mobbed. And so I just, just tiptoed off into the night. Um, so, um, and thanks to Greenlight for existing and to everyone for showing up tonight. I see this amazing um, number of participants, three, 336 it says right now. So um, <clears throat> I, uh, I, w I once wrote a, a poem to Greenlight Bookstore and I thought I would read it because it just, I don't know, it just came to mind that I would do that. So I'm gonna read two poems, I'll explain them each. This first one is called Greenlight Toast and it was um, uh, ten the 10th birthday, I guess. Yeah, it must have been that, yeah. Oh, fifth, okay. I'm getting a signal, it's the, it was the fifth. So I wrote, I wrote a, um, a toast for drinking because it was a party then, like it's a party now. And uh, it's, you know, it just, it's a real, uh, now it's a time capsule piece because it's about the physicality of bookstores. Green light toast. Here's a birthday toast to the green light staff. So raise up a tall boy or a flask or carafe and drink to the pleasure of stitching and binding and shelving and windows and a till that needs minding. A neighborhood bookstore is a social oasis, so be sure that you shop on a regular basis. The courage invested in bricks and in mortar needs celebrating with ales and with porter. If for books you can touch, you've a thirst that's unquenchable, just watch you don't spill, for those pages are drenchable. Some booksellers destined to clean up the food and opposed to online, you can't shop in the nude. Well, of course, now that's, I guess that's all we do anymore is just sit at home and shop in the nude. So this is really a very um, antiquated poem. Um, I have not been able to write very much in this um, quarantine, but I have written a couple of poems and this is brand, a brand new one. I've, I've been writing a sequence of poems and by sequence, I mean, there are three of them that are addresses to books, uh, direct address to, to a book. And um, so this is a, a direct address to the Gast trilogy which I got in, myself into a really uh, awkward situation with. It's a, if you don't know the Gorman Guest Trilogy by Mervyn Peake, it's a fantasy trilogy, which sounds promising, um, with no magic, wizards, elves, dwarves, uh, or anything else in it, just old people living in a castle who are really sad. And um, I, ma I made the mistake during the quarantine of getting myself in a situation where I'm reading the Gorman Guest Trilogy aloud to a 10 year old because he saw the castle on the cover and we both made the mistake of committing to this. So this is a, a direct address to the Gorman Grass trilogy um, under the circumstances of reading it to a 10 year old. And, and you can see from my bookmark how far we've, we've gotten uh, in, the, in the months. All the, all the opaque references in here are just names of characters in this wheezy, endless book. To the Gormengast Trilogy. What the hell is your destiny, Titus Groan, and how did I get here? Setting out reading morbid Bildungsroman to avid 10-year-old. Occupation for pandemic quarantine. We're entombed in stone walls. Peaks airless, painterly, dust-lathered prose. It took four chapters, six nights, to accomplish, accomplish the christening. Ugly baby. 150 pages before feral steerpike clambered through nervous fuchsia's window. They ain't kissing. I recall you, Trilogy, at the velocity of teen reading protocol. Fillet any text for its happenings. Absorb color or texture subliminally. Whatever else, keep moving. There are other books to read. Yet, given options, the kid picked you. He yearns for the pictured castle. How bad can it get? No Gandalf or Dumbledore's gonna air this thing out. Gormenghast's a starvation diet of fullness, a pageant of Kafka in Dickens' disguises. Yet when the silhouettes widen their mouths, Peak wakes up, and me too. If you're painted in the dust of Gilded Turds trilogy, your dialogue is Ernst Collage Quicksilver. It's crazy good. So you've converted me to ham performer, Gorman Gast. I'll do the freeze in different voices. I'll sell this thing if it kills me. Thank you.
Thank you. Oh my gosh, I, I didn't expect to hear more poems tonight. And you were giving us rhyme, meter, and scansion. I stand. <laughs> I appreciate you. <laughs> um, our next reader is the incredible Nicole Dennis Ben. Uh, of course, her debut novel, Here Comes the Sun, um, was a New York Times Notable Book of the Year, a 2017 Lambda Literary Award winner. Um, her new novel, Patsy uh, is a 2020 Lambda Literary winner, uh, Stonewall Book Award winner. She's been on the Today Show. And I just want to say, uh, Nicole, your book, Patsy, meant so much to me as a queer Black person. It was a story that um, is right on time and was rightly told. I am so happy to have you here. So let's turn it over to Nicole. Thank you so much for that introduction, Saeed. And thank you all for having me. I'm so excited to be celebrating Greenlight Bookstore with people who I look up to. All of you guys are wonderful. I've been enjoying this reading. And just a shout out to Greenlight, you guys have um, launched my two books, Here Comes the Sun and now Patsy, both hardcover and paperback. So I'm really grateful and I'm really happy to be doing this. I'm gonna write, read a, a very short excerpt from Patsy, which Saeed had just brilliantly introduced um, to you guys. So. It's really short, just to not take up too much time, um, and also self-explanatory as well. All right. There are two types of devil's cone, one in which you cannot bring yourself to leave the room, much less the bed, to do the simplest things, and the other in which you go through the motions in a constant stupor. Patsy lies in bed, turned away from the dark, heavy thing that has returned, its shadow dimming the room. With the cover over her head, she closes her eyes, not wanting to see it. God knows how long she has gone without eating. She could die, she knows, though death doesn't seem that scary after all. Not as scary as the dark thing. Here in America, there are no bush teas for it. No bitter mix of ram goat roses, rosemary, lemongrass, bissy, and other herbs. No pasta to come with a bottle of sanctified olive oil. No neighbor from the country who can wring the neck of a goat or sever it with a machete for you to bathe in its blood. No time to lie down and let, let it run its course. She's powerless against it. The real hell is allowing this place to eat you alive, Fiola says to Patsy, when she notices that she has been lying in the same spot on the bed inside her studio from sunup till sundown. How many rotations has the sun gone through since Patsy climbed in the bed that night after seeing Sicily. She slips in and out of sleep. She wakes to feel Una shaking her. Patsy, Patsy, Patsy. It reminds Patsy of her daughter's voice, how it would pull Patsy from the lips of a deep sleep. Here she's in the midst of it, hating it, terrified of it, and yet her only thought is of true. During those years, it was the anticipation of going to America to see Sicily that had kept Patsy alive. But what is keeping her alive now? Where will she find the strength that would protect her from the spells? How can she live knowing that she lost Sicily to her American dream? It is then that what Fiona had said about not having the luxury of choosing love makes sense to Patsy. That's, that's what it all boils down to. Choice. When has she ever been given a choice? Never. She has never been given a choice to say no the first time her legs were pried open. Never given a choice to rid her body of, of the grievance she had to carry for nine months. Never been given a choice to look, look at another woman and allow herself to be carried by the feeling without blood. Bright red and glistening glass sticking to her like shadow. And now, now the promise of life comes with accepting the fact that she will never have a choice. Thank you. Wow. Beautiful. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Nicole. Um, also, there are a lot of fans of your apartment and your decor. So, you know, congratulations on that as well. <laughs> Our next reader uh, is the uh, in, uh, inimitable Colson Whitehead, uh, the author of nine books of fiction and nonfiction, The Underground Railroad, which won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and the National Book Award. And of course, in 2020, it's still 2020, uh, he won his second Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, The Nickel Boys, and I am pretty sure made history um, just an incredible person. And I feel like is a gamer, 
I don't know this for sure, but this is my opportunity to, to get Colson to confirm that he loves playing video games. Colson Whitehead. Okay, how do you do? Uh, it's great to see all you people. It's like the apocalypse is not even happening. Uh, I hope to see you on the other, the other side. Uh, two years from now, three years from now, how long it takes. Um, I have been playing uh, XCOM, that's my sort of one game. Uh, everything else is too fast and I'm kind of old and stuff like that. Um, I'm gonna read some new stuff. Uh, um, it's a book that takes place in, it's called Harlem, Sh Harlem Shuffle. It takes place in 1964, um, this section anyway. There's um, Zap, is someone getting electroshocks. And there's some reference to submarines, uh, submarine movies like uh, Run Silent, Run Deep, and Journey to the Bottom of the Sea, sort of figure in the, the sky's lifestyle. So I'm um, just going to read it. The rest of that fall and winter was a mumble. Freddie crashed on Linus's living room couch most days until his lease ran out and he moved in full time. They woke, grazed around Greenwich Village and Times Square, got high, made fun of TV soap operas. They put their feet up in movie houses and occasionally snorted a little something. And come nightfall, ricocheted through various coffee shops and cocktail bars and basement oases, propelled by debauched momentum. Sometimes Linus drove them out to Jersey in his Chevy 210 to bet on the horses at the garden. Linus was part owner of a thoroughbred named Hot Cup, a birthday cup from his great uncle James, who was a scion of derby culture and thought you weren't a man unless you had a piece of a racehorse. Hot Cup's lofty pedigree notwithstanding, his father, General Tip, was a legend in championship jism circles. On the track, he was an oddly distracted specimen, listless and morose. Much like his part owner Linus, Hot Cup was well-bred, well-raised, and utterly incapable. These ventures and others were underwritten by the Van Wick family, who mailed checks on the second Friday of every month if Linus upheld the meager duties of his office. Show up groomed and presentable for family functions and society benefits. Visit the law offices of Newman, Shears, and Whipple to sign where they told him to sign. Good to see you, Mr. Van Wick. The work is for the birds, Linus said, but you can't beat the hours. He kept his nice clothes at his parents' apartment, gone to his uniform for work, and slipped back into beatnik attire when he punched out. One day, Linus split for his grandma's 96th birthday and didn't come back. He rang three days later from the bubbling Brook Sanitarium in Connecticut. His family had hijacked him when he stepped off the elevator and dispatched him for another round of psychological treatment. Zap! Per periodically, the Van Wicks scooped up their wayward son and carted him off to a succession of licensed facilities, an archipelago of mental recalibration centers dotting the tri-state area. Linus's first stint was during his Princeton days. The dorm proctor caught Linus sucking some townie's dick or vice versa. Freddie couldn't remember which. Zap, zap. Freddie sighed and shuffled for two weeks and then accepted Linus's abduction as a sign from Jesus or God or the big whatever that he should make a change. He decided to clean up. He got his own place in Hell's Kitchen on 48th Street, two floors above a chop suey joint. Linus had his sanitariums. Freddie's version of mandatory shit getting together was enduring a series of square jobs, like a chump or a monk performing grunt work to prove something to an empty sky. Stocking shelves in Gristidi's over on Lex, operating a register at Black Ace Records on Sullivan, selling sneakers at a sports outlet on Fulton Street in fucking Brooklyn. Of the three, Black Ace was the best, was better for meeting girls. He hit the books, not school books, but dime novels, Strange Sisters, Violent Saturday, her name Jezebel. Stories where no one was saved, not the guilty, killers and crooks, and not the innocent, Orphans scooped up at bus stations, librarians inducted into worlds of vice. Each time he thought things would work out for them. They never did, and he forgot that lesson each time he closed the covers. So optimistic as he plucked the next one from the spinning racks. The novels passed the time, as did the pawn shop TV and the occasional girl in a rumpled skirt. His type, barely beating back the darkness. The mission. Reemerge when he had his shit together. Freddie imagined a loud gong would tell him when it was time, reverberating, shaking pigeons loose, spook half the west side of Manhattan. 
He took up a pipe and on warm nights perched on the fire escape overlooking 48th, puffing the iron scaffold of periscope that allowed a view of the sleepy churning Hudson while the saxophone of Ornette Coleman barked and bleated on the hi-fi, ringing the city's death rattle from its harrowed throats. In his own period of isolation, Freddie's cousin had cultivated ambitions, starting a business, settling down with a nice lady. Now that Freddie stopped and thought about it, he was at a loss. All he knew was that he didn't want to be who he had been. Climb over the windowsill, flip the record, return to this periscope, scan the horizon. It all ended when he ran to Linus outside Café Wa, and like that they signed up for another tour, and the ship sank into the black water, and it was as if the world had never known them. Thanks. New work from Colson Whitehead, incredible. Um, Colson, Amanda Stern, well, first of all, someone said XCOM is a good game. And uh, I think Amanda Stern said, ah, Colson, still funny during the apocalypse, which tracks, I love it. I'll learn for your next book. Thank you. All right, um, I'm so excited about our next writer because I, I met Lev Grossman um, at Greenlight Bookstore. I believe it was a, like a bookstore day event and um, I was just absolutely delighted. Um, he, of course, is the author of five novels, including uh, the international bestseller uh, Codex and the New York Times bestselling trilogy uh, Magicians. I, I love the show. I'm just, I am continuing to grieve. The end of the magicians. Um, but fortunately, uh, Love's newest book, The Silver Arrow, a novel for children and Saeed Jones, apparently, uh, will be published uh, September of this year. So excited about it. Love Grossman. Thank you so much, Saeed. Um, uh, and thank you to Greenlight for hosting this incredible event. Uh, Greenlight is uh, my local bookstore. It is astounding. Uh, I remember my neighborhood before Greenlight was in it, and it is just astounding what a bookstore can do to transform the feeling of uh, a neighborhood. I feel like I've done my part personally to prepare Greenlight for the apocalypse because I bring my kids there every Saturday and they trash the joint. So they've bounced back from that every time and they will come back from this. Uh, I actually wrote this book for my children. Um, uh, it is a novel for children, uh, which I wrote when we ran out of Roald Dahl. Uh, and it's about a girl named Kate who has just turned 11 and she has a younger brother, Tom, uh, and she's very bored and she wants, she just longs to, she senses the presence of that great grown up world that is ahead of her and she longs to be part of it and she is not yet. Um, and of course she will discover a little bit about that world during the course of the book and she will realize that once you have seen that, you can never unsee it. Um, before I start, I want to apologize for the lighting in this room, which is very dark. It's because this is not my house um, and I can't find the light switch. Because of a letter that Kate writes to her uncle Herbert, who is mysterious and wealthy, as all uncles should be. Dear uncle Herbert, you've never met me, but I'm your niece, Kate. And since it is my birthday tomorrow and you are super rich, do you think you could please send me a present? Warmly, Kate. Reading it over, she wasn't sure it was the greatest letter anybody had ever written, and she wasn't 100% sure that the word please was in the right place, but she thought it contained her personal truth, which her language arts teacher always said was the important thing. So she put it in the mailbox. Probably nobody would ever read it because she hadn't put an address on the envelope because she didn't know where Uncle Herbert lived. She didn't even have a stamp for it, which made it all the more surprising when a present from Uncle Herbert arrived the very next morning. It was a train. Kate didn't especially want a train. It's not like she was into trains. It was more of a Tom thing. But after all, she had not asked for anything specific and she guessed that her uncle probably didn't have much experience with kids. So Kate tried to be philosophical about these things. What was really surprising though was how big it it was. I mean, this thing was really big, like too big to send through the mail. It arrived at their house on a specially reinforced double wide flatbed truck with 28 wheels. It was giant and black and incredibly complicated. In fact, it didn't look like a toy train at all. It looked like an actual real life-sized steam train. That, Uncle Herbert explained, was because it was one. Uncle Herbert had come to deliver it personally. He was fat with thinning brown hair and a mild-mannered round face. He looked like a history teacher or somebody who might take tickets at an amusement park. K 
Kay was so surprised she couldn't think of anything to say. That is a really big train, was all she came up with. It would have to do. It's not a whole train, Uncle Herbert said modestly, just the engine and a tender. That's the coal car right behind it. How much is it weigh? Tom said. 100 tons, Uncle Herbert said crisply. What, exactly, Kate said, like it literally weighs exactly 100 tons? Well, uh, no, Uncle Herbert said, weighs 102 tons, 102.36. You're right to be suspicious of overly round numbers. I thought so, said Kate, who was. You really don't appreciate how incredibly colossal a steam locomotive is till one shows up parked on the street in front of your house. This one was about 15 feet high and 50 feet long, and it had a headlight and a smokestack and a bell and a whole lot of pipes and pistons and rods and valve handles on it. Kate's father came out of the house. Herbert, he said, what the blazes is this? He didn't really say blazes, but you can't put the word he did say in a book for children. It's a train, Uncle Herbert said, steam train. Well, I can see that, but what is it doing here on a truck so very close to my house? It's a present for Kate. And Tom, I guess, if, he, if she wants to share, he turned to Kate and Tom. Sharing is important. Uncle Herbert definitely didn't have much experience with kids. Well, it's a nice gesture, Kate's father said, rubbing his chin, but couldn't you have just sent her a toy? What is a toy? Well, no, Herbert, that's not a toy. That's a real train. I suppose, Uncle Herbert said, but technically, if she's going to play with it, that's sort of, by definition, it's also a toy, if you think about it. Well, Kate's father stopped and thought about it, which was a tactical error. What he probably should have done, Kate thought, was lose his temper and call the police. Her mother didn't have this problem. She came tearing out of the house, yelling, Herbert, you blazing idiot. What the blaze do you think you're doing? Get this thing out of here. Kids, get off the train. She said that last part because while all this was going on, Kate and Tom had gotten up onto the flatbed truck and were starting to climb up the sides of the train. They couldn't stop themselves. They reluctantly got off it and retreated to a safe distance, but Kate still couldn't stop looking at it. It was giant and black and complicated with lots of fiddly little bits that obviously did interesting things and a cozy little cab that you could sit in. It looked ominous and fascinating, like a sleeping dinosaur. The longer you looked at it, the more interesting it got. And it was real. It was almost like she'd been waiting for it without knowing it. Stenciled along the side of the tender in small white capital letters were the words, the silver arrow. That was its name. They'd written it with a long thin arrow sticking through the letters. It's not even silver, Kate's father said. It's black. And what would you do with a silver arrow anyway? Hunt werewolves, Kate said, obviously. Thank you. Obviously, uh, I love that. Uh, Chris Huntington said, Greenlight, you kept a copy of The Magician's Land at the register and got Mr. Grossman to sign it, then mailed it to me. You are a great store, thank you. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's why we're all here. Um, this is, you know, this event is incredible and magical. It kind of feels like amidst everything that's going on. And again, it's a direct reflection of, of you know, the community Greenlight has created. Um, similarly, Ann Patchett, you know, one of our country's foremost literary citizens, uh, by way of Nashville. Uh, she is the author of three books of nonfiction, two children's books, and seven novels, including, of course, Bel Canto, uh, and most recently, uh, Commonwealth. Uh, Parnassus Books is, is another institution, you know, and as someone who no longer lives in New York, um, I increasingly have, uh, you know, more and more appreciation for people who are putting other cities and other literary communities on the map as Anne has done for Nashville. Also, she makes a great breakfast. Anne Patchett. <laughs> hey, hey everybody. Greenlight, um, Greenlight is Parnassus's big sister. And when we decided that we wanted to try and open a bookstore, my business partner, Karen Hayes and I, we went to Greenlight and we just followed everything that you did. And I'm sitting here right now thinking, we have not been able to figure out this Zoom author event thing. And I feel like I understand it so much more. And this is so much more fun. Like I thought I was doing you a favor, but this has actually been amazing. 
And I have loved seeing everybody. And those of you who have not come to Parnassus, I mean, green light's great, but once you get your vaccine, <laughs> come on down to the South. We would love to have you. Okay, I'm gonna read a little piece that I wrote for The Guardian about bookstores and what's going on. We closed Parnassus Books, the bookstore I co-own in Nashville, the same day that all the stores around us closed. I can't tell you what day that was because I no longer have a relationship with my calendar. All the days are now officially the same. My business partner, Karen, and I talked to the staff and we told them if they didn't feel coming, comfortable coming in, that was fine. We would continue to pay them for as long as we could. But if they were okay to work in an empty bookstore, we were going to try to keep shipping books. The first week we did curbside delivery, which meant a customer could call the store and tell us what they wanted. We would take their credit card information over the phone and then run the books out to the parking lot and sling them through an open car window. Curbside delivery seemed like a good idea, but the problem was so many people were calling that all the staff wound up clustered around the cash register, ringing up orders. It was no good. So we reassessed and decided that all the books would have to be mailed, even books that were going down the street, and now we're doing curbside again. We make our plans, we change our plans, we make other plans. This is the new world order. Our bookstore is spacious and tidy, with rolling ladders to reach the highest shelves, a long leather sofa and cheerful children's section with a colorful mural featuring a frog telling a story to a wrapped pack of assorted animals. The back room is the polar opposite, a barely contained bedlam jam with desks, towering flats of broken down boxes, boxes full of new releases, boxes of books that need to be returned. There are Christmas decorations, abandoned spinner displays, dog beds, and a lot of day old donuts. We are squashed in there together, forced to listen to one another's personal phone conversations and sniff one another's perfume. It is not the landscape of social distancing. But in the absence of customers coming in to browse, the backroom folks have moved into the capacious storefront, setting up folding tables far away from each other to make our private spaces. We crank up the music, we pull books off the shelves. The floor is a sea of cardboard boxes. Orders completed, orders still waiting on one more book. We make no attempt to straighten up anything before we leave for the night. We have neither the impetus nor the energy. We have bigger fish to fry. Orders are coming in as fast as we can fill them. I think of how I used to talk in the pre-pandemic world going on about the importance of reading and shopping local and supporting independent bookstores. These days, I realize the extent to which it is true. I understand now that we are part of a community as never before and that that community is the world. When a friend of mine stuck in his tiny New York apartment told me he dreamed of being able to read the new Louise Erdrich book, I made that dream come true. I can solve nothing. I can save no one. But damn it, I can mail Patrick Ryan a copy of The Night Watchman, at least for now. We're part of a supply chain that relies on publishers to publish the books and distributors to ship them and the postal service to come and pick up the boxes and take them away. We rely on our noble booksellers filling those boxes to stay healthy and to stay away from each other. So far, this fragile ecosystem is holding, though I understand exactly how it can fall apart. Today is what we've got. This quiet day in which finally there is time to read again. So call your local bookstore and see if they're still shipping. It turns out the community of readers and books is the community we needed in the good old days, and it's the community we need in hard times, and it's the community we will want to be there when this whole thing is over.
my gosh, and that was incredible. I felt like that was like the, the State of the Union address uh, for, for, for book lovers. Thank you, that was so beautiful. Um, our uh, next writer, uh, you know, among the various impacts of his incredible uh, work, he empowered me to start randomly Venmoing white people for reparations every February and June uh, with mixed results, but I'm going to keep at it. Anna uh, Hasekotz is the author of the best-selling books, The Beautiful Struggle, We Were Eight Years in Power, Between the World and Me, which won the National Book Award in 2015, and his first novel, The Water Dancer, was released in September 2019. He also dabbles in comics, as you probably know. Tani Hasekotz. Hey, guys. Um, wow. I'm actually a little overwhelmed uh, by the company I'm in uh, right now. I think um, one of the things that uh, is, is not said enough because writing is, is such private and independent work is how much of a quiet community it actually is. Um, I am at least on my screen, I'm next to Jennifer Egan, um, who's um, uh, writing and whose actual poetry, if I may go so far as to say, lyricism, I can still like hear in my mind. And I think about it. when I was doing my last edits for the water dance, I was thinking I'm trying to get to that level. And on my screen next to Jennifer is Anne, who when I had to go through uh, my last negotiation, um, and we don't need to talk about that too much. Um, it was beautiful to have somebody with some experience, not just you know in the world of writing, writing but in the world of uh, book selling to talk to. Um, I don't know if Lev is still here, but he's, uh, he's diagonal from me, but I worked with him at, at, at Time Magazine. As you can see, I'm quite old by now. Um, <laughs> but I worked at, 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 with him at Time Magazine a lifetime ago where I was having a really, really hard time and he was somebody who counseled me. Um, Gia is somewhere below me, I believe. Um, you know, who's a good friend. We've, you know, talked talk quite a bit, you know, as I've watched her and been able to pass on, you know, some of the wisdom that folks passed on to me. And, 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 and of course, um, um, I mean, I, I don't know what you can say about Colson Whitehead. Um, I read The Intuitionist when I was 25, 26, and it was the first book that made me feel like, wow, I might want to give a, sh uh, a shot at this, but I don't know that I can actually do it this good. So, or even close. So it was at once um, terrifying and inspiring at the same time. And, um, you know, it's been what, you know, some 15 years and, and I still feel that, that, that way about Colson's work. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just honored to be here. And, and at the center, obviously that, that community is our independent bookstores, right? What would we do with our green light books? Um, the, these are nodes uh, of, of the community that I just, you know, try to outline. Um, and, and, and without them, without those institutions, we'd all be lost. Um, as a community of writers, um, we are uh, often called upon to respond to uh, the, the, the events of the day. And in, anybody that's been watching the news, anybody that's, that's you know, been paying attention knows what, what those events are at, at this moment right now. Um, the lynching of, of, of Joy, George Floyd, uh, the, the murder of, of Breonna Taylor, uh, the names that just keep coming over and over and over again. Um, I have, you know, done some amount of work, you know, writing about that, but, you know, you see this so much that after a while you, you, you just become speechless and you almost feel like your own words really don't have the power to, to, to respond or, or say anything new. How many ways can I say the world is fucked up, you know? How many ways can I say white supremacy is really, really bad? How many ways can, can you say I, I can't breathe? Um, and so you, you find yourself you know, I'm almost struggling uh, uh, to say anything new uh, because you feel like, um, you know, you don't want to just, you know, be repeating yourself and, and doing it for, for the hell of doing it. In, in those moments, um, I find that the thing to do is to go back to the original work um, that inspired me to write in the way that I write now. Um, American racism and white supremacy in America. The, the forces that, that killed George Floyd, that killed uh, Breonna Taylor are uh, so very old. Um, but as old as those forces are, are the responses of black writers. And so when, when, when I you know, saw that agonizing lynching of George Floyd, 
I, I thought about between the world and me, but I didn't think about my between the world and me. I thought about the between the world and me that inspired me originally, Richard White's Between the World and Me, which is a, a narrative of a lynching, but also a narrative of how we remain trapped by history, by how if history is not dealt with, one does not have or enjoy the luxury of simply being uh, an observer. And so uh, if, if I could, you know, um, just read uh, Richard Wright as, as, as opposed to, you know, uh, my own words. I think that, that that's quite appropriate for the moment that we find ourselves in. Um, I read uh, Between the World and Me, Richard Wright's Between the World and Me, the, 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 the superior Between the World and Me, when I was a student at, at Howard University, um, and I was about 19 or 20 years old, and it, it haunted me, it has haunted me ever since. At that point, I thought I might one day have the talent and ability to, to be a poet, um, but that never quite materialized, um, but this poem, stuck with me um, and hopefully it'll stick with you in the same way. Uh, this is Between the World and Me by Richard Wright. And one morning while in the woods, I stumbled suddenly upon the thing, stumbled upon it in a grassy clearing guarded by scaly oaks and elms. And the sooty details of the scene rose, thrusting themselves between the world and me. There was a design of white bones slumbering forgottenly upon a cushion of ashes. There was a charred stump of a sapling pointing a blunt finger accusingly at the sky. There were torn tree limbs, tiny veins of burnt leaves and a scorched coil of greasy hemp. A vacant shoe, an empty tie, a ripped shirt, a lonely hat and a pair of trousers stiff with black blood and upon the trampled grass were buttons, dead matches, butt ends of cigars and cigarettes, peanut shells, a drained gin flask, and a whore's lipstick. Scattered traces of tar, restless arrays of feathers, and the, longer, and the lingering smell of gasoline. And through the morning air, the sun poured yellow surprise into the eye sockets of the stony skull. And while I stood, my mind was frozen within cold pity for the life that was gone. The ground gripped my feet and my heart was circled by icy walls of fear. The sun died in the sky. A night wind muttered in the grass and fumbled the leaves in the trees. The woods poured forth the angry yelping of hounds. The darkness screamed with thirsty voices and the witnesses rose and lived. The dry bones stirred, rattled, lifted, melting themselves into my bones. The gray ashes formed flesh, firm and black, entering into my flesh. The gin flask passed from mouth to mouth. Cigars and cigarettes glowed. The whore smeared lipstick red upon her lips and a thousand faces swirled around me, clamoring that my life be burned. And then they had me, stripped me, battering my teeth into my throat till I swallowed my own blood. My voice was drowned in the roar of their voices and my black wet body slipped and rolled in their hands as they bound me to the sapling. And my skin clung to the bubbling hot tar falling from me in limp patches and the down and quills of the white feathers sank into my raw flesh and I moaned in my agony. Then my blood was cooled mercifully, cooled by a baptism of gasoline. And in a blaze of red, I leaped to the sky as pain rose like water, boiling my limbs, panting, begging. I clutched childlike, clutched to the hot sides of death. Now I am dry bones and my face, a stony skull, staring in yellow surprise at the sun. Thank you, guys. Wow. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for reading that poem by Richard Wright. Um, it's incredible how things being what they are, simple clarity is so powerful. And I feel as many people in the chat have expressed just you saying George Floyd was lynched, you know, Elijah McClain was lynched, Breonna Taylor was lynched, um, is not just impactful, but necessary. Thank you. 
Um, our next reader, our penultimate reader of the night, and this has been, again, just an incredible, incredible evening, is Valeria Lucelli. Uh, she's the author of several critically acclaimed and award-winning books, including the wonderful The Story of My Teeth, Tell Me How It Ends, an essay in 40 questions, and most recently, the novel Lost Children Archive, which was named one of the New York Times Best Books of 2019, and was another one of Barack Obama's favorite books of the year. Like, actually, like, Barack Obama is trash because if he was good, he would be paying attention to this event since like his entire library has been reading uh, tonight. Uh, Valeria uh, has been twice nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Kirkus Prize. And I turn it over to her now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Saeed. It's such, such a pleasure to listen to all of you. I have been basically only listening to the thoughts of a 10 year old and an 18 year old since March. So I, for I forgot that the <laughs> there's this as well. Um, it's been lovely to just listen. Uh, I'm gonna read a couple of fragments from something that I've been writing. Um, yeah, that's all. <clears throat> the March moon, according to my mother, is in Venus. And whoever knows if that's a good or a bad omen, but she sends us a message from her town with a photograph. Ahí se ve clarito, clarito en la foto, la luna en Venus. My daughter studies the image, holding the phone up to her face, and tells me as I lay out our dinner on the kitchen table. She says the full moon is in Venus, but here it just looks all black with two white smudges of little somethings. And it's true, the little somethings. In our sky, in any case, in the heavy sky above us, the event is invisible. Our sky is covered by thick storm clouds and it is cold out. So we're inside the house having dinner. Other things, some trivial, some large, are tormenting us. Ants taking over the kitchen counters, moths in the cabinets and closets, a leak in the basement, a sick friend, a project overdue. Tomorrow and tomorrow and the pinches menstrual cramps on the full moon. And always, always the ambulance sirens blaring outside. All day, but especially all night, the ambulance sirens. They speed uptown on Broadway, then turn west into 230th Street and slowly wind their way into the curling streets of our neighborhood. Their paramedics climb up the stairs of tenement buildings, knock on the doors of apartments, and entered into the cluttered, silenced depths of the lives of others. They pass the bookshelves, scan the family portraits on the walls of a hallway, ignore the dishes left unwashed in the kitchen sink, pass a bedroom where a bed was left unmade, and finally reach the living room where they kneel down next to a woman breathing slow and heavy a woman who has been waiting, breathing, sitting on an armchair. She stretches out her arm, pulls back the sleeve of her sweater, and with, her wiry, and with their wiry instruments, the paramedics check her pulse and heartbeat. Emergency, not emergency, not emergency. Okay, let's wait and wait some more, but wait for what? What are we waiting for and for how long? The sirens, like church bells, like seismic alarms, like warplanes overflying a city under siege, are the new pacemakers of our shared experience of time. However constant in their cycles though, they always surprise us. They catch us absent-minded, the sirens, find us fragmented inside the chaos of everydayness, cleaning, cooking, reading. With their punctual urgency, they extract us from the dispersed cloudiness of our daily rituals and plunges into the very heart of fear, which is the only common ground we now have. Fear, the public space we share, the only communion we partake in. All of us reunited in it from within our multiple isolations. Once the sirens have us there, neatly aligned and amassed, stopped in our tracks, like a silenced, disciplined army of fretfuls, they do not offer solace. They do not offer the palliative of protocol even. There are no instructions given, no roadmap to tell us what comes next. 
The only thing the sirens offer is a pause, a pause to remember, to reckon, to acknowledge our enormous collective solitude all day, every day, all day, all day long, the ambulances. The full moon in June, the strawberry moon, comes with a heavy rainstorm. My mother writes to say, hoy hay eclipse penumbral. We're not sure if a penumbral eclipse is a good or a bad omen, but we follow her instructions and plant three garlic cloves under the moonlight. For a few days now, outside in the streets, there has been an outrage, uplifting, potent, long overdue, demanding racial justice and denouncing police violence. My daughter is uneasy, asks that I read something to her in bed. I have W.E.B. Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folk on my bedside table. She wants me to read Du Bois. You sure? I ask. Yes, I'm sure. He writes in 1903, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. It still is in the 21st century. And how many more years before we can fully dismantle the institutions that reproduce the logics of oppression that stemmed in colonization, genocide, slavery, relocations. The ambulance sirens have been replaced by police sirens and choppers. My daughter says these sirens from police cars are so much worse than the ones from ambulances. The first were a reminder that there were people out there who'd come to save you if you were short of breath. The second, a reminder that some are suffocated to death on the basis of being black. All day, all night, the sirens. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valeria. That was beautiful, beautiful. Um, our last reader of the night um, is the uh, wonderful Jennifer Egan. She's, of course, the author of several novels and a short story collection. Her most recent novel, Manhattan Beach, was a New York Times bestseller and was awarded the 2018 Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction. Her previous novel, A Visit from the Goon Squad, won the 2011 Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and was recently named as one of the best books of the decade by places like Time Magazine, Entertainment Weekly, and Saeed Jones, and she is also the president of PIN America. Jennifer Egan. Thank you so much, Saeed. Um, boy, this is a tough one to close out, I have to say, um, to, uh, to read after so many of my literary heroes, but um, thank you for a great evening, all of you, which I've really enjoyed. And I thought in honor of this disembodied gathering that we're having in a hypothetical space, I would read from a Gothic thriller that I published years ago called The Keep. The Gothic genre tends to involve disembodied communication in imaginary spaces. And of course, a bookstore is a space full of imaginary spaces, which is why green light has become such a, an essential and indispensable part of our neighborhood. And I'm, thank you everyone for supporting them. They're amazing. All right, so we're, gonna, we're following Danny, a club promoter who has been trying for hours to get inside a castle, it's a Gothic novel, uh, in an indeterminate European country. And he has come there to help his cousin, Howard, renovate the castle into a hotel. They haven't seen each other since childhood when Danny hurt his cousin, Howard, very badly. All right. Danny walked with his arms up and his cell phone on through the basement or dungeon or whatever it was, in a castle that belonged to Howie. He'd come a long way to meet his cousin here, and his reasons were practical, making money, getting the hell out of New York. But Danny was also curious, because over the years, news about Howie kept reaching him through that high-speed broadcasting device known as a family. Bond trader, Chicago, insane wealth, marriage, kids, retirement at 34. And each time one of those chunks of news got to Danny, he'd think, see, he's okay, he's fine, he's better than fine, and feel a bump of relief followed by another bump that made him sit down wherever he was and stare into space. Because something hadn't happened that should have happened to Danny. 
or maybe the wrong things had happened or may or too, maybe too many little things had happened instead of one big thing or maybe not enough little things had happened to combine into one thing bottom line danny didn't know why he'd come all this way to howie's castle why did i take a writing class i thought it was to get away from my roommate but i'm starting to think there was another reason under that you who the hell are you that's what someone must be saying right about now. Well, I'm the guy talking. Someone's always doing the talking. Just a lot of times you don't know who it is or what their reasons are. My teacher, Holly, told me that. I started the class with a bad attitude. For the second meeting, I wrote a story about a guy who fucks his writing teacher in a broom closet until the door flies open and all the brooms and mops and buckets come crashing out. It got a lot of laughs while I was reading, but when I stopped reading, the room went quiet. Okay, Holly says. Reactions? No one has a reaction. Come on, folks. Our job is to help Ray do the very best work he can do. Something tells me this may not be it. More quiet. Finally, I say, it was just a joke. No one's laughing, she says. They were, I say. They laughed. Is that what you are, Ray? A joke? Now there's muttering, ow, and shit, and what about that, Ray man? And I know they expect me to be pissed, and I know I'm supposed to be pissed, and I am pissed, but not just that, something else. There's the door, she tells me, and points. Why don't you just walk out? I don't move. I can walk out the door, but then I'd have to stand in the hall and wait. Well, what about that gate? She's pointing out the window now. The gate is lit up at night. Razor wire coiled along the top, the tower with a sharpshooter in it. Or what about your cell doors, she asks, or block gates, or shower doors, or the mess hall doors, or the doors to the visitor entrance. How often do you gentlemen touch a doorknob? That's what I'm asking. I knew the minute I saw Holly that she'd never taught in a prison before. It wasn't her looks. She's not a kid, and you can see she hasn't had it easy. But people who teach in prisons tend to have a hard layer around them that's missing in Holly. I can hear how nervous she is, like she planned every word of that speech about the doors. But the crazy thing is, she's right. The last time I got out, I'd stand in front of doors and wait for them to open up. You forget what it's like to do it yourself. She says, my job is to show you a door you can open. And she taps the top of her head. It leads wherever you want it to go, she says. That's what I'm here to do. And if it doesn't interest you, then please spare us all because this grant only funds 10 students and we only meet once a week and I'm not gonna waste everyone's time on bullshit power struggles. She comes right to my desk and looks down. I look back up. I wanna say, I've heard some cheesy motivational speeches in my time, but that one's a doozy. A door in our heads? Come on. But while she was talking, I felt something pop in my chest. You can wait outside, she says. It's only 10 more minutes. I think I'll stay. We look at each other. Good, she says. So when Danny finally spotted a light in that castle basement and realized it was a door with light coming in around it, when his heart went pop in his chest and he went over there and gave it a shove and it opened right up into a curved stairwell with a light on. I know what that was like. Not because I'm Danny or he's me or any of that shit. This is all just stuff a guy told me. I know because after Holly mentioned that door in our heads, something happened to me. The door wasn't real. There was no actual door. It was just figurative language, meaning it was a word a sound door, but I opened it up and walked out. Thank you. Jennifer Egan, thank you so, so much. Um, guys, as you know, I'm, I'm seeing all of your, your wonderful notes. It's been an incredible evening and she wasn't planning on speaking at the end of the night because she says she's on the edge of tears, but to say goodbye, I just, we have to give the floor one last time to Jessica on behalf of Green Life Books. Get over here, Jessica, on the screen. <laughs> Get over here. We're all sitting in our same places we've always been. I just have to say thank you. What 
an incredible, like beyond our expectations and our expectations were pretty high, honestly. Thank you to everyone who's here and for all the awesome things you're saying. Thank you to these readers and for feeding our souls. Uh, I, I mean, just the range of notes that were struck all over the map, but creating this incredible symphony. I'm just super overwhelmed. And all of the wonderful things that you've said about the bookstore it makes us all the more eager to see your faces again. So we hope to see you again soon. Again, we beg your patience. As as Anne knows, we it's really important that, that no one uh, has has bad health outcomes because we all want to see each other in the bookstore again so we're prioritizing that but we will be there again the stacks will be there and all of these authors will be there and and we'll keep reading together thank you guys for an amazing evening good night <laughs>